We're ready. Okay. Well, at least, well, at least start with the preliminary stuff here. Well, I welcome everybody to the uh, Critical Area Commission meeting with the Chesapeake and Atlantic Coastal Bays. Um, the Critical Area Commission is holding this meeting virtually due to the current public health emergency. This meeting is being held using Microsoft Teams and will be streamed live to the public. The public will be able to view the meeting from the Commission's website and the meeting will be closed captioned. Minutes of the meeting will also be provided on our website. Let me just review a few quick ground rules here. All microphones will be muted. We ask that you hold all your questions or comments until the end of each presentation. Please announce yourself by name when speaking so that the other attendees on the phone can identify you. If you're joining us by phone for the meeting, uh, please press star six to unmute yourself. The public was invited to submit written comments on any agenda item up to 24 hours prior to the meeting. Those comments, if received, will be read by our executive director, Kate Charbonneau, at the appropriate time. I don't believe we have any comments, but we'll ask Kate. Um, I think right now we'll we'll go to a roll call of uh, commission members. Kate, are you ready for that? I am ready. Um, I'm going to call your name. Those who I know are on. And at the end, if I've missed you, um, please chime in and let me know. So. We have Commissioner Adams, Commissioner Blazer, Commissioner Ferguson, Commissioner Grant, Commissioner Greer, Commissioner Hewitt, Commissioner Jacobs, Commissioner Johnston, Commissioner Laird, Commissioner Lewis, Commissioner McCarthy, Commissioner Mahoney, Commissioner Marks, Commissioner Merritt, Commissioner Parker, and Commissioner Debbie Her Cornwell, Commissioner Hertz, Commissioner McCall, Commissioner McDowell, Commissioner Oberg, Commissioner Roberson, and Commissioner Varney Alvarado. And I may have missed someone joining us by phone. Are there other commissioners on the line? Yeah, Mike McCarthy's here. Hi, Commissioner McCarthy. And Commissioner Bradshaw, are you perhaps joining us by phone? I am. Great, thank you. I am. Great. Okay, that's it. That's it. Very good. Well, for, first of all, um, we're lucky we have a new commissioner for this meeting. This is our <laughs> fifth our fifth meeting in 2021, which has kind of set all kinds of records for a number of meetings. Uh, as you all are aware, we meet the first Wednesday of every month, and we've pretty done pretty well this year, even though it's all virtually. But I'd like to introduce uh, Mayor Dawn Jacobs of um, Rock Hall. She was appointed by the governor last month and got sworn in. So Dawn, if you could maybe just say a few words about yourself and then we'll get on to approving the minutes and other business. Certainly. First of all, I'd like to um, thank thank you for the appointment. I'm, I'm really excited to be part of this. Um, I'm the mayor of Rock Hall, have been for two years. Uh, after I was elected, I was also town manager, so swam in the deep end of the pool for about uh, two and a half months till we got a town manager on board. But it was a wonderful opportunity to learn a lot about how the town functioned and also critical areas. Uh, so much of our town is in the is in a critical area zone. Um, so that, that's primarily what I've been doing. Uh, I'm an accountant by trade. Um, which has its pluses and minuses. Um, and uh, my husband was the mayor prior to me being mayor uh, for a total of 12 years. Um, I was uh, often aware of his role also on the um, uh, Critical Areas Commission. He was a member of that for a while. And then he moved on to the House of Delegates and that background in critical areas took him into the environment and there in the House. Uh, where he still is uh, involved and now ranking member. But um, because of his role here and and also at the state level, I find myself in, in this role and uh, with both hats now and uh, really am looking forward to all of it. The first two years had a COVID factor, or the first year, the second year rather, had a COVID factor, which was an extreme challenge here in the town. 
but we're moving on. We're going to have a 4th of July parade and one heck of a celebration to go with it. Very good. Well, thank you, Dawn. It's a pleasure to have you on the commission. Uh, we'll move now to, you know, assume you all had a chance to read the minutes. Um, any corrections to the minutes? If seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve those minutes. So moved. Who was that? Oh, that was uh, Commissioner Ferguson. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? Second, Commissioner Hertz. Thank you. All right, uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? Seeing none, the minutes are approved. So we'll just move right on into our program. Uh, first presentation, which is um, from Annie on St. Mary's Critical Area uh, Program. Yes, thank you, Chairman Deegan. Um, hopefully everyone can or see my screen. Um, again, I'm Annie Sikarik, and I will be presenting St. Mary's County's proposed pending matters text amendment. A representative from the county, Bill Hunt, is on the line to help answer any questions you may have. For reference, St. Mary's County is located in Southern Maryland on the Western Shore, shown here in red. You may recall that at the April Commission meeting, the county requested and was granted an extension of time to approve their 1,000 foot critical area boundary map update in order to incorporate pending matters language into their comprehensive zoning ordinance. The commissioners of St. Mary's County voted to adopt the pending matters legislation on May 18th, 2021 in accordance with the approval requirements associated with the time extension request. The proposed pending matters text amendment allows certain permit applications to be governed by the critical area 1000 foot boundary line as it existed on or before May 18th, 2021 for a certain limited period of time. The proposed text is shown on this slide and can be found on pages one through two of the staff report. And this text matches the language that was previously approved by the commission in 2017 for Queen Anne's County. So I will turn it back over to you, Chairman Deegan. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Anybody in the chat room? Seeing none, I will recognize Sue Greer, Chairman of the Program Subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Program Subcommittee recommends concurrence with the Chairman's determination that the zoning text amendment identified as St. Mary's County Ordinance 2021-2022 be processed as a refinement to St. Mary's County's critical area program Further, as the proposed changes are consistent with the purposes, policy, and goals of the critical area law and regulations, the program subcommittee recommends the chairman approve ordinance 2021-2022 as proposed. Well, thank the committee very much for the recommendation and I'll consider that my final decision. Thank you very much. And now we'll go back to Annie Sikarik uh, and we're gonna talk about St. Mary's County again. Yes, thank you. Um, again, I'm Annie Sikarik, and I will now be reviewing St. Mary's County's critical area map update. As part of the comprehensive overhaul of the critical area law by the General Assembly in 2008, a requirement was included to remap the 1,000 foot critical area boundary based on recent technologies. In July 2012, the Commission adopted regulations that addressed the process for updating the maps. Subsequently, each local jurisdiction is undergoing a critical area mapping update. As noted in the previous presentation, the county was granted an extension for map approval at the April Commission meeting in order to incorporate pending matters language into their zoning ordinance. The commissioners of St. Mary's County adopted the updated 1000 foot critical area boundary maps within the approved extended time frame. The mapping update resulted in a net gain of 3708 acres. The main reason for this gain is that the county's original critical area maps had errors in which there were numerous instances where the boundary previously measured less than 1,000 feet. Um, just to provide some examples, uh, this map shows an example of an area that saw a gain in critical area due to errors with St. Mary's current layer being mapped incorrectly. The red line is the current boundary and the green line is the proposed updated boundary. As you can see, the current boundary is less than 1,000 feet from the tidal wetlands shown in yellow. This is an example of a natural gain as well as an incorrectly mapped boundary line. 
Current GIS technology showed a natural expansion of the wetlands as compared to the original 1972 wetland maps. However, the red line shows that the county's current boundary was also mapped incorrectly as it should match up with the black line. Therefore, as represented with the green line, there is a significant gain in critical area acreage in this area. And it's difficult to see, but the black line is kind of in between the red and green here. And finally, this is an example of a loss in critical area acreage due to the error in the county's current mapping layer. Now I will hand it back over to you, Chairman Deegan. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Seeing none, that, that's that's a pretty simple one. The, line's what, the line is what it is. I'll recognize the Chairman Sue Greer. For Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, the program subcommittee recommends concurrence with the chairman's determination that the St. Mary's County mapping update can be reviewed as a refinement to the St. Mary's County critical area program. The program subcommittee further recommends the chairman approve the St. Mary's County map amendment as proposed. Thank you very much. I appreciate the committee's effort there and I will accept their recommendation and it'll be my final decision. Okay, that that does it for the program subcommittee. You guys did good this morning. I listened. Then thank you, Annie. We'll move now to the project subcommittee, and we have uh, Kate Durant. And we're going to talk about the uh, Eastern Correctional Institute high temperature hot water line and security fence upgrades in Somerset County. We don't do much in Somerset County. That's true. We don't. So, okay. All right. Yeah, Thank Kate. you, Chairman Deegan. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yep, we're doing awesome. good. Thank you. Um, so, good afternoon. I am Kate Durant, and I will be presenting the Eastern Correctional Institution, or ECI, High Temperature, Hot Water, and Security Fence Upgrade Project. Um, <clears throat> Maryland Environmental Services, or MES, operates the facility. Uh, Mike Farner is the consultant working on the project and will be joining us for the meeting. So as Chairman Deegan <clears throat> mentioned, this project is located in Somerset County at 30420 Revels Neck Road. So shown here on the left. Um, it's about halfway between Princess Anne and Westover, if you know your Somerset County geography, but it's located right off of Route 13. And as you can see in this critical area map, again, here's the general location of the project area. It's <coughs> critical area designation is Resource Conservation Area, or RCA. And the site is approximately 238 acres. The Maryland Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services is proposing to replace and elevate the existing high temperature, hot water, and steam distribution systems that supply hot water to all of the buildings, including the central laundry and the kitchen, that are located inside their perimeter fence because they're integrated. Um, they are also proposing to upgrade the perimeter and interior security fences because the existing fences and the electronic security are deteriorating due to groundwater and they need to be upgraded to meet current security standards. The proposed upgrade includes constructing 7,829 linear feet of piping for the new high temperature hot water system, which will be mostly above grade replacing the security fence and replacing the security gates. The project will take two years to construct and is located outside of the critical area buffer. The orange line shows the approximate location of the security fence and high temperature hot water line because they run parallel to each other. <clears throat> so the, <coughs> excuse me, the limit of disturbance or LOD for the project is approximately seven and a half acres, um, mostly due to the fact that it's quite a bunch of linear feet and then you have to account for extra space for access on either side. 
Um, the lot coverage will only increase by approximately 2,055 square feet due to the addition of 654 pipe supports that are each two feet in diameter. The proposed project is required to meet the Critical Area Commission's 10% phosphorus reduction requirements, and the annual removal requirement was calculated to be 0 0.85 pounds of phosphorus per year. The applicant will meet this requirement by planting 20 trees, which will be a mixture of red oak, sweet gum, and white swamp oak, and installing rooftop disconnects. On the left side of this picture, outlined in blue, um, is the approximate location of the rooftop disconnect outfall area. And then outlined in green is the approximate location of the planting area. Additionally, according to the letter of authorization issued by the Maryland Department of the Environment on May 30th, 2019, the improvements will permanently impact approximately 4,028 square feet of the 25 foot non-tidal wetland buffer. These impacts will be mitigated according to MDE requirements. <clears throat> State agencies who are proposing development activities on state-owned lands need to demonstrate that they have considered the likelihood of sea level rise inundation and that the project incorporates climate resilient practices in order to avoid or minimize environmental or structural damage associated with a coastal hazard, an extreme weather event, sea level rise, and other coastal impacts. So this coastal resiliency slide shows the sea level rise mapping for zero to two and two to five feet of sea level rise. On the left hand slide, you can see the zero to two feet of sea level rise in lighter blue. And then on the right hand picture, you can see zero to two feet in light blue and two to five feet in the darker blue color. As you can see the existing facility and the proposed locations for the security <clears throat> fence and high temperature hot water systems, which are located along the outside edge, um, are located outside of the projected areas of sea level rise. Also, the project is located outside of the surge area for category three storm events, and it will not impact wetland adaptation areas. Uh, <clears throat> Our office reached out to other state agencies for comments and from the Maryland Department of Environment, we found out that the stormwater management concept plan was approved on August 27th, 2019 and the sediment and erosion control plan approval is pending. I believe during our morning meeting that Mike Farner said that final approval was granted on May 26th of this year. So that happened about a week ago. Um, and that will be coming to us, I'm sure. The Department of Natural Resources Wildlife and Heritage Service determined that there are no records of any state or federal rare, threatened, or endangered species within the project site. The Maryland Historical Trust determined that there are no historic properties in the area. A trust resource review on the United States Fish and Wildlife Service website indicated that there are no U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service listed endangered species, refuges, or fish hatcheries in the vicinity. Public notice was published in the County Times on May 12, 2021, and a sign was posted along southbound Route 13 and Revels Neck Road. So no comments were received. With that, I will hand it back to Chairman Deegan. Thank you, Kate, and I will uh, send it straight over to um, Chairman Sandy Hertz, the chair of the project subcommittee. Thank you, Chairman Deegan. On behalf of the project subcommittee and in accordance with the staff report and presentation, I move that the commission approve the Maryland Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services proposal to upgrade the high temperature, hot water and steam distribution piping and replace the existing security gate and fencing 
at the Eastern Correctional Institute. The project will improve the longevity and reduce potential corrosion of ECI's high temperature hot water piping and will increase security, bringing it up to current standards. This motion is offered in accordance with the staff report and presentation and the following conditions. One, MES shall provide a signed planting agreement to commission staff within 60 days of completion of the project. Two, before the start of construction, MES shall provide copies of all final approvals, including stormwater management and sediment and erosion control plans to commission staff. Okay, do we have a second? Mr. L Commissioner Laird? Yep, Commissioner Laird, second. Thank you very much. Do we have any discussion and questions? Anybody in the chat room? Seeing no, I assume you're ready to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Do I have any abstentions or uh, nay votes? Seeing none, the motion carries. Thank you very much. And while we're getting ready for Jen Esposito, I uh, should have mentioned a little earlier that under the program subcommittee, Jen did a presentation for um, growth allocation highlights. We're going to put that, I think, Kate, we're going to send that to everybody in an email on a YouTube link or something. Yep, Bob already has it done and we'll send that out this afternoon. So anyone who missed the presentation is welcome to go view it on YouTube. Very good. All right, Jen, you ready for the um, Maryland Department of Transportation uh, Port Administration Memorandum of Understanding? Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Let me just share my screen. And and if, you, if you insist on, on putting the picture of the kids up, you got to tell us their names and how old they are. <laughs> I will. This is being recorded, right? For like everyone. <laughs> <to see. laughs> um, yeah. Um, so thank you, Chairman Deegan. Um, I'm Jennifer Esposito. Today I'm presenting the Maryland Department of Transportation Memorandum of Understanding Exhibit A4 for the Maryland Port Administration. Um, before I again, I just want to inform you that we do have representatives joining us today from MPA to help answer any questions. They have helped um, remove this exhibit along the way for the past two years. So a really special thank you for your time and contribution. So the existing memorandum of understanding or MOU between MDOT and the commission was last updated in 2019. Um, the MOU outlines the process for review and approval by the commission for MDOT projects located within the critical area. The MOU includes exhibits for each M MDOT transportation business units or TBUs. The exhibits are specific to each TBU and include specific projects that can be reviewed, the thresholds for disturbance or impacts for projects that can qualify under the MOU and the necessary mitigation. This proposal represents an update to the MPA exhibit, which was last updated in 2007. And as we work through the presentation today, I ask that you have a copy of the Exhibit A4 so that you may follow along with some of the sections that will be referenced during the presentation. So MPA is the state agency responsible for increasing waterborne commerce through the Maryland ports for the benefits of the citizens of the state. And to fulfill its mission, MPA must operate along the water's edge and many of its operations are deemed water dependent. Most of MPA's property are highly developed and industrial in nature. MPA um, owns property, uh, they, they are located throughout the state of Maryland, and it consists of the more industrialized marine terminals, as you see here, examples of the Seagirt Marine Terminal to the north and the Dundalk Marine Terminal to the south. Also consists of the uh, dredge material containment facilities, which is still industrial in nature, they just look a little bit different. Um, to the more environmental sensitive um, restoration areas such as Poplar Island, which many of you commission members have visited. So while the overall layout and structure is similar to other MDOT TBU exhibits, the amendment, um, the amended exhibit includes new innovative concepts and provisions which have not been previously used in other MOUs with other state agencies. The updated exhibit includes, um, if my computer might be froze, okay, there we go. That we designated portions of MPA as waterfront industrial area. 
we mapped areas designated for environmental restoration or conservation as designated restoration areas. We updated and restructured the categories of general approval. We revised the mitigation section and included a fee and loose structure. And we included annual reporting and tracking requirements. So now I wanna draw your attention to page A4-2 of the exhibit. The purpose of this section or section A is to designate MPA properties as either a waterfront industrial area or designated restoration areas, depending on the site specific activities and uses performed on the site. Natural resources article 8-1808.3 allows impervious surface and the buffer for certain improved activities, such as for water dependent facilities or activities within a map modified buffer area under a variance or provided in a waterfront revitalization area or a waterfront industrial area. So all MPA facilities that are not mapped as a designated restoration area are considered waterfront industrial area or WIA. This designation allows MPA to continue with its daily operations without assessing the water dependent nature of each individual proposed activity or traditional buffer mitigation. Also accommodate some types of cargo or other non-water dependent storage and processing facilities that are required on the terminal to support operations. As an example, again, the secret marine terminal as a close up, you can see that almost every square inch is impervious surface, all hardened to the bulkhead and almost every square inch is, is utilized for some capacity, very industrial in nature. Currently, um, or portions of MPA property which are designated for environmental restoration or conservation will be classified and mapped as designated restoration areas. Non-water dependent activities are to be located outside the buffer at DRAs. Currently, um, DRA sites include Poplar Island, Hart Miller Island. This is uh, Masonville, this is, um, sorry, the Hawkins Point um, mitigation bank site, which is a tree planting site that turned out wonderful. Um, also includes Masonville Cove and the Swan Creek easement area, which is all the green you see here at the at Cox Creek. So now we're moving on to section B of the exhibit, which covers category of general and commission approval. And section B starts on page A4-4 of the exhibit and covers category one, two, and three type, type projects. So for category one, um, projects can be found on page A4-4 um, dash four through 10. These projects are limited reporting activities that cover maintenance activities or minor improvement projects. There is a list of parameters that each project must meet and to be qualified under a category one project. Category one is also divided into two subcategories that is covered under category one A and category one B. Category two includes minor redevelopment or new development activities. The qualifying parameters and limits for category two projects can be found on pages A4-10 through 11, and the similar requirements can be found on page A4-12 of the exhibit. And lastly, for category three, um, you can refer to pages A4-12 through 13. Category three projects are major development activities that require commission approval. Category three is not included in other MOUs that felt it was necessary to provide more clarifications for projects that fit under category two, um, because for category two, we don't list out the specific project type. Additionally, category three is included in this exhibit because of the new mitigation structure that is eligible for all MPA projects. And I'm gonna now provide a brief example um, of projects that will fit under each category type. The purpose of category 1A is to allow for non-development related activities, maintenance activities for existing facilities, and minor improvements to existing facilities. This includes the removal of trash and debris or cleanup efforts. It also includes maintenance of existing pavements, parking lots, and roadways, and site management activities within the confines of the existing dredge material containment facility that includes interior dikes, dewatering, grading, all the activities that are, that are in the confines of the dredge material containment facility. 
The full list of Category 1A projects, um, you can find those on pages A4-6 through 9 of the exhibit. The purpose of category 1B is to allow for minor improvement projects to existing facilities that require mitigation. These activities are frequently proposed by tenants who lease MPA property and wanna improve the site to meet their specific needs. This often requires a quick review timeframe. All category 1B projects require review and verification on a project by project basis. They may require fee and loan mitigations and size limitations may apply. Additionally, the overall qualifying parameters for Category 1 apply and cover both Category 1A and B type projects. The full list of projects can be found on page A4-9 of the exhibit. Category 1B projects include the picture you see here, which is a new or out of kind tart fabric building over an existing impervious surface, um, and the installation of out of kind replacement of existing above ground storage tank, just to name a few. And then for example, for a category two project, um, details for the qualifying parameters and some other requirements for category two, as I think I stated earlier, can be found on pages A4-10 through 12 of the exhibit. Example, as you see here, uh, we just recently reviewed under staff level review um, of a, new, a construction of a new 1600 square foot shed. A little bit more minor, but it's a new development project. And then for category three projects, all major development activities that require review and approval um, by the commission will fit under category three. Details of this can be found on page A4-13 in the exhibit. Project types include, but are not limited to, development activities that exceed category two project parameters, new or expanded dredge material containment facilities, a new or expanded marine terminal, and then also filling open water for new island restoration. So now we're moving on to section C, which provide details on the mitigation requirements and the fee and loop program. If you're still following along of the exhibit, we are still on page A4-13. The exhibit authorizes MPA to apply an alternative set of mitigation standards to all projects and activities in the critical area. And sections of Comar allows for this proposal as well. For MPA sites, it's, it is difficult to get on-site mitigation, as most of the sites are comprised of impervious surface and the use is industrial nature. Additionally, most stormwater management practices are not conducive to site condition. So section C of the exhibit replaces the regular buffer mitigation and the 10% stormwater management phosphorus production requirements with a new standardized calculation that addresses both habitat and water quality goals. And this is just an example of the, the constraints that, that the port has to work with them. This is Masonville. And again, as you, again, you can see that there's a lot of impervious surface to deal with. Um, a lot of stormwater management practices are not conducive to the ground conditions. So mitigation for habitat and water quality impacts, they're assessed at a rate of $1.50 per square foot of impact. And this is based on various factors, such as the square footage of new impervious surface, the square footage of new or out of kind replacement structure over existing impervious surface, for projects that are exempt from stormwater management, or i.e. projects that disturb less than 5,000 square feet. And the mitigation ratios will range between a half to one to two to one. And this is based on the location of impact, if it's located within or outside the buffer or over open water. The full list of habitat mitigation rates can be found on pages A4-13 through 14 in exhibit. I'd just like to note that a considerable amount of research was conducted by MPA and CAC staff um, or commission staff to determine an appropriate fee and lieu rate and offsets. While the structure and fee and lieu amount works well for MPA, it may not necessarily be transferable to other state agencies. This proposed structure is very specific to MPA, its operations, and the on-ground conditions of MPA properties. And the research was conducted to find a structure that worked for both MPA and critical area, while also ensuring the goals of critical area are still being met. MPA may satisfy critical area mitigation requirements through a fee and loop program. 
as approved by the commission. Details on the fee and loop program can be found on page A4-14 exhibit. The fee and loop can be used for plantings, either inside or outside of the buffer, stormwater management practices that have a habitat component, or other innovative beneficial habitat water quality projects, or in accordance with the partnership through a separate agreement. The next presentation you will hear is by Ms. Annie Sikarik for an MOU that outlines the fee and loop program for which if it's approved, MPA may utilize. And this is a picture of Masonville Cove, which was a um, restoration mitigation project as an example of something of a more of a large scale project that could be actually implemented through the fee and program. And for those commission members who have not been in the site, it's highly recommended. It's a beautiful site to go see. And lastly, um, Section D covers the annual reporting and tracking requirements. MPA is required to submit an annual report to the chairman by March 1st to cover the projects for the previous calendar year. For the full list of reporting um, requirements, you can um, refer to page A4-15 of the exhibit. And just a brief note about climate resiliency. Um, POMA requires state agencies to conduct an assessment of climate resilient practices that address coastal hazards, extreme weather events, and sea level rise. MPA currently reviews projects during planning to determine if they're located in the zone of sea level change and flooding. We've coordinated extensively with um, MPA to understand their planning and, determine, and, and how they determine the location of certain projects. Um, given this, Commission staff will consider all Category 1 projects to meet the Commission's climate resiliency regulations within COMAR. Projects that fall under Category 2 or 3 will be required to address the Commission's climate resiliency requirements um, on an individual basis. And the exhibit um, comes with three attachments. Attachment one is the definitions for either MPA specific or critical area terms for the purposes of the exhibit. That can be found on page A4-18 through 20. Attachment two provides detailed description, meets and bounds, and maps to accurately demarcate the boundaries of the designated restoration areas. And this can be found on page A4-21 through 31. And lastly, attachment three, which is the vegetative management activities general overview. This document summarizes regularly occurring activities related, um, related to vegetation and landscape management at the various types of MPA facilities. Um, these attachments are meant to be a living document that may be updated on an annual basis. And with that, Isabel and Brooklyn, well, um, I guess this We'll turn it back to Chairman Deegan for questions and, um, and discussion. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> Good job. And I know you would have spent a lot of time on it and particularly want to thank uh, MDOT staff and the Port Administration. Uh, I think we all realize how important the port is to the state of Maryland. So uh, with that, you know, if anybody has any questions, anybody in the chat? Don't, oh, yes, we've got somebody in the chat. Who we got? Okay. I am waiting for my computer to show. I think it looks um, like Commissioner Ferguson uh, raised. Say that again, Charlotte. Uh, Commissioner Ferguson has his hand raised. Uh, yes, this is um, a general comment. Both this project and the following project uh, talk about uh, climate resiliency analysis. And I think it would be really useful for the commission to have a staff member walk us through the uh, pieces and the parts that constitutes the analysis for climate resiliency. Um, I, I did a little reading on it and I found that there were typically six parts to it, but I'd really like to see how the staff goes through that uh, in their uh, work. Uh, that would help to uh, at least illuminate uh, some of us that are relatively new on the commission. Sure thing, Commissioner Ferguson. We will take that into consideration and, and work on a presentation for um, a future meeting. Yeah. Okay, I will now reckon we have another hand. It's, it's 
it's my hand, but um, <laughs> I, is that, I wanted is to that follow. Commissioner Sandy Hertz, the chairman of the Project Cup Subcommittee? It is. Um, I'll, I'll I was recognize you. <laughs> <laughs> Why, thank you. Um, before I go into my motion, I just wanted to um, follow up on what Commissioner Ferguson and had indicated and also recommend maybe that we have a presentation on the climate ready action boundary, um, which would help indicate where projects that are located in the coastal areas are also being evaluated through the Coast Smart program, um, and that could help us uh, with that discussion, just as a suggestion. Um, all right, so I will move into the motion now, if that's OK, Chairman Deegan. Yes, ma'am. OK. Um, on behalf of the project subcommittee and in accordance with the staff report and presentation, I move that the commission approve exhibit A4 of the Maryland Department of Transportation Memorandum of Understanding for general approval. The exhibit establishes the conditions for general approval of Maryland Port Administration projects. Is there a second? There's a second, Commissioner Marks. Thank you, David. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I assume you're ready to vote. All those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Are there any abstentions? This is Commissioner Hertz. I am abstaining from voting. Okay. Any nays? Seeing none. The motion carries with one abstention. Thank you very much. And Jennifer, you did a good job. It, I know that Thank took a lot of, lot of time and, and make sure the people at the port and MDOT uh, know how much we appreciate their efforts as well. Will do. We're happy the heavy lift is hopefully over for now. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, now we'll recognize uh, Annie Sekurek again, and she's going to continue with this uh, board administration and MDOT. And we're even going to throw in the Chesapeake Bay Trust. Yep, we'll I'm going to throw we'll in another little aspect. Yeah, I get a lot of mail from them. I don't know why. Maybe it's because I write them a check occasionally. Well, it's a great organization. Um, so again, thank you, Chairman Deegan. Yes, I'm Annie Sikarik, and I will now be reviewing the proposed three-party memorandum of understanding, or MOU, between the Maryland Department of Transportation, Maryland Port Administration, or MPA, the Critical Area Commission, and the Chesapeake Bay Trust. Um, representatives from MPA and the Trust are on the call, and I'd like to again thank them for all their time and cooperation throughout this process. Um, so as you probably recognize this image from the previous presentation, um, but this is an aerial image of two MPA facilities in Baltimore City, Seavert Marine Terminal and Dundalk Marine Terminal. Both of these properties are active marine terminals and are highly developed, even up to the buffer. Therefore, it can be difficult to find appropriate space on site for mitigation resulting from development activities in the critical area. So due to the highly impervious nature of port facilities and subsequent difficulty in providing on-site mitigation, an entirely fee-based mitigation program was developed as part of the updated MPA exhibit, as uh, Ms. Jennifer Esposito just described in the previous presentation. Uh, the fee and lieu program generates mitigation funds resulting from MPA development and redevelopment projects in the critical area. And the updated MPA exhibit allows the port to use fee and lieu money in accordance with a partnership through an approved separate agreement. So MPA has elected to partner with the trust through a three-party MOU. The purpose of the proposed MOU is to establish a program to use fee and lieu money to provide offsets to achieve water quality and habitat protection objectives for addressing impacts from MPA projects in the critical area. Staff from MPA, the commission, and the trust work together to develop the MOU with the intention of identifying and funding a variety of habitat and water quality related projects in underrepresented communities near port facilities. The Chesapeake Bay Trust is a nonprofit grant making organization created by the Maryland General Assembly in 1985. The trust has established competitive grant programs to fund environmental education and restoration initiatives throughout the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Overall, this proposed MOU will allow MPA to use the trust's existing grant programs to solicit and implement projects to fulfill their critical area 
mitigation requirements. So I will now uh, describe the roles and responsibilities of each party as outlined on page two of the staff report. And for reference, the full list of each party's roles and responsibilities can be found on pages three through five of the MOU attached to the staff report. Uh, for MPA's roles and responsibilities, they may elect to transfer fee and lieu mitigation funds to the trust. However, the use of this MOU is optional. Uh, the Commission agrees to accept the water quality and habitat protection offset projects solicited and selected by the trust and Commission staff may participate in the project review and selection process. And the trust will use their existing grant programs to solicit and fund environmental restoration projects in accordance with the processes outlined in the appendix to the MOU. Appendix A, which is located on pages 11 and 12 of the attachment to the staff report, establishes the scope of work for the trust. In the appendix, eligible projects are targeted to areas of Baltimore City, Baltimore County, and Anne Arundel County. As noted, the MOU targets projects in underrepresented communities that are located within a specified geographic area around MPA facilities. The trust developed this informal GIS boundary map to use as an internal reference as they review and identify potential projects to be funded under this MOU. Eligible project types include, but are not limited to, restoration projects, community or pollinator gardens, protecting open space, conversion of vacant lots to green space, and outreach or engagement projects that have a hands-on habitat or water quality component. And I want to note that we wanted to keep these project types and siting criteria general in order to allow for greater flexibility and more innovative opportunities for funding. And the appendix also includes the processes by which the trust selects and manages an eligible project, which varies depending on the type of grant program. The full process can be found on pages 11 and 12 of the attachment to the staff report. For small scale projects selected through the Community Engagement and Restoration Mini Grant Program, the trust will manage all tasks, including distribution of funds, phasing of awards, and managing budgets. For larger scale projects selected through the Outreach and Restoration Grant Program, the trust will perform these same tasks, but they will also invite staff from the Commission and MPA to participate on the Technical Review Committee to evaluate proposals. Further, in an effort to ensure that long term management measures for large scale projects meet critical area standards, the trust will coordinate with the Commission on all projects costing $100,000 or more. Uh, now I will now provide a quick snapshot of some of the uh, types of projects that are funded through these grant programs. On this slide is an example of a mini grant project. Uh, the goal of this project is to engage the community in planting native plants and raising monarch butterflies with the installation of native pollinator gardens. Uh, the Baltimore Tree Trust used a $5,000 mini grant award to plant trees, remove impervious surface, and clean up trash while engaging volunteers in Baltimore City. And here is an example of a larger scale project that was awarded under the Outreach and Restoration Grant Program. So with their award, a church in Baltimore was able to install a bioretention system in order to treat runoff from the parking lot. And then this is another project that was also awarded a grant through the Outreach and Restoration Program. Uh, this award funded the installation of a stormwater best management practice in Prince George's County. So finally, uh, the trust is required to provide the Commission and MPA with an annual report on the status of all funds and all projects planned and implemented under this MOU. Commission and MPA staff will review the reports to ensure that the trust is awarding the fee and loan money in a timely manner and consistent with the purposes of the MOU. So thank you, and I will now turn it over to Chairman Deegan. Okay, do we have any questions for Annie? Seeing none, I'll recognize the chair of the project subcommittee, Sandy Hertz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On behalf of the project subcommittee and in accordance with the staff report, and presentation, I move that the Commission approve the three party memorandum of understanding between MDOT, MPA, the Commission, and the Chesapeake Bay Trust as proposed. Is there a second? Second, Commissioner Johnston. Okay. Anne Arundel County, we covered Baltimore and Anne Arundel now. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded. Um, assume you're ready to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Are there any zero. abstentions? 
Hi, this is Commissioner Hertz. I will be abstaining. Okay. Are there any no votes? Seeing none, the motion carries with one abstention since Sandy works for the Department of Transportation. And again, um, Annie makes make sure the staff at uh, particularly the Chesapeake Bay Trust uh, and um, the port and everybody involved know how much we appreciate you know getting this done. Uh, it, it's it's not easy. It sounds easy. Oh, we got a memorandum of understanding, but a lot of work went into it, and I want to say how much I appreciate it. Next, we'll move on to uh, Michael Gr Grassman, who's going to talk about Mar another trust, American Historical Trust and Jefferson Patterson Park Museum with a memorandum of understanding for them. Are you ready, Thank Michael? You. I am. Thank you, Chairman Deegan. All right. Can everyone see my got, screen? You got to be in a pretty section of the state to do this one. Yeah, it's a it's a lovely park. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Grassman. I'm going to be wrapping up the MOU train here this afternoon with a uh, MOU for Maryland Historical Trust and Jefferson Patterson Park and Museum. For those of you who are not familiar with Jefferson Patterson Park and Museum or JPPM, it is located in Calvert County near the town of St. Leonard on the banks of the Patuxent River. Uh, JPPM is a state-owned property that is owned and managed by Maryland Historical Trust, uh, encompassing land area, infrastructures, facilities, and utilities are all within Mar Maryland's critical area on lands designated as RCA. Uh, we have Greg Pierce and Marika Arsky who are from JPPM in attendance. They can help answer any questions that you may have. And you'll see there are a bunch of pictures of the park and uh, various facilities throughout the presentation, a few of which I will call out as we go on. As was previously mentioned, Comar 270203 grants the commission the authority to enter into these types of agreements, provided an MOU describes a process by which classes of activities will be conducted so as to conform with critical area requirements. Jefferson Patterson Park and Museum, on behalf of Maryland Historical Trust, seek the commission approval of an MOU governing certain activities on JPPM lands within the critical area. Should an activity exceed the parameters of this MOU, commission staff will direct JPPM to submit for full review and approval projects to the commission. Uh, proposed MOU, including Exhibit A, Attachment 1 to Exhibit A, and Attachment 2 to Exhibit A, will cover varieties of activities within the park and are all attached to your staff report. A little bit of background for those of you that uh, aren't familiar with JPPM. As mentioned, the land is owned and managed by Maryland Historical Trust. It is listed in the National Register of Historical Places as Patterson Archaeological and Historical District. The archaeological sites on the park span over 9,000 years of human use and occupation throughout Maryland. And the lands were donated to the state uh, by Mary Marvin Breckenridge Patterson on June 16, 1983. The property houses a number of different uh, facilities and access for the public. Uh, the Maryland Archaeological Conservation Laboratory, or the MAC Lab, is pictured in your upper right-hand corner of the slide. There is a 20th century point farm complex, a visitor center, an event space, and pictured in the bottom right hand corner of the slide, you'll see a authentic representation of a Native American village, uh, which has sites throughout the park. Here's I am frozen here. Couldn't get through the whole day without a technical difficulty. I take full responsibility, Michael. I, I think I jinxed you earlier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pardon me. Let me uh, see if I can reload it. There we go. All right. So um, another thing that the park does quite a bit of is have different events and activities for the public. Uh, they showcase different artifacts that have been found in Maryland throughout different periods of time. They host uh, the Highland Celtic Games. This weekend, if you're around uh, Calvert County, they're going to have the Marvelous Mutts presentation. 
And I believe this year is the 24th anniversary of the Patuxent River Wade-In, Bernie Fowler's Patuxent River Wade-In, which they, um, they do as an annual event to assess the water quality of the Patuxent River. Hey, Mike. Sorry yes. to interrupt, but your presentation is not showing. Oh, man. <laughs> All right. Let's try one more time. We're seeing slides now, and right. we do from current slide. How are we doing? Oh, we got it. All right. Let me go back one here just to, so everybody can see some of the events that are going on. All right. Back on course. <laughs> um, the purpose of this MOU is to provide a streamlined process for review of specific types of maintenance and redevelopment actions uh, throughout the park and the necessary mitigation while keeping project review at the staff level. Uh, this will address potential impacts to the critical area from restoration and maintenance or different construction activities while requiring the appropriate measures to manage, mitigate, and offset things in a consistent and uniform manner. Similar to other MOUs that we have seen today, this MOU itself pertains to the legal agreement between JPPM and the Critical Area Commission, including each party's responsibilities. Exhibit A of the MOU is the specific breakdown of projects allowed to be reviewed under the MOU, um, such as qualifying parameters for each category of project and mitigation. Attachment 1 to Exhibit A is a master mitigation plan for the entirety of JPPM property within the critical area. And Attachment 2 to Exhibit A is a site-wide climate resiliency analysis, which provides a baseline tool for JPPM staff to use when considering uh, projects that are within climate vulnerable areas throughout the park. Exhibit A, um, specific project review parameters are outlined in Exhibit A. Uh, projects are either classified as Category 1 or Category 2 activities. Category 1 activities allow for maintenance or minor improvements to existing facilities such as road, um, trails, landscaping projects, some stormwater management. Uh, there are no clearing limits or mitigation requirements for the removal of volunteer saplings within specified areas of the property. And a list of projects for category one activities is noted in Exhibit A. The background of this slide, you'll see the uh, Patterson House. This is a category two project, uh, which represents new and replacement or uh, repair development activities, changes to the layout or design of existing facilities. The 10% pollution reduction requirement for Category 2 projects will be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. The qualifying parameters state that no impact to habitat protection areas other than the buffer may occur unless they are minor in scope and consistent with COMAR Title 27. Category 2 projects also have established thresholds for forest and developed woodland clearing limits. They must provide appropriate mitigation for any clearing. They must minimize disturbance to the buffer and will incorporate climate resilient practices using the site-wide climate resiliency analysis, which is attachment two to exhibit A. Additionally, this MOU does not cover any impacts to medium or high priority wetland adaptation areas. Therefore, any projects that may impact these areas have to come into the commission for review and approval. As mentioned previously, the commission and JPPM work together to standardize the mitigation requirements under this MOU recognizing that JPPM has unique needs and constraints, but must also meet critical area reg regulations. Uh, the collaboration resulted in a master mitigation plan, which is attachment one to exhibit A. Uh, this establishes guidance for stormwater management, including some areas to identify appropriate places for stormwater management best management practices, and also identifies on-site and off-site areas where mitigation can be met throughout the park. COMAR 2702-0502-A2 states that state agencies are required to consult with commission as soon as practicable in the project planning process to assess climate resilient practices that address coastal hazards, extreme weather events, sea level rise, and other impacts. Attachment 2 to Exhibit A is a site-wide climate resiliency assessment of the park, and JPPM staff will use this analysis to determine whether a project is in a vulnerable area. If so, they will follow processes and procedures outlined in the attachment. JPPM will also review all applicable state 
or capital projects in accordance with the Coastmark construction guidance. On March 1st of each year, JPPM will provide the chair of the commission with a report on those projects that qualify as category one or category two with justification as described in exhibit A of the MOU. This report should also include any outstanding mitigation requirements as described in section 7.2 and 7.3 of the MOU. And the exhibit and their attachments may be amended periodically with written consent of the points of contact listed in the MOU. The commission chairman will update the commission on any amendments or modifications to the exhibits and their attachments at a meeting following the agreed upon changes. Once approved, the MOU shall remain in effect for full force for a period of five years, unless otherwise terminated in accordance with the provisions stipulated in the MOU. And with that, I will take any questions. If not, I will turn it over to Chairman Deegan. Thank you, Michael. Good job. Um, I'll recognize the chair of the project subcommittee, Sandy Hertz, one last time. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman Deegan. On behalf of the project subcommittee and in accordance with the staff report and presentation, I move that the commission approve the Maryland Historical Trust and Jefferson Patterson Park and Museum Memorandum of Understanding for general approval. The MOU establishes the conditions for general approval of Maryland Historical Trust projects at Jefferson Patterson Park and Museum. Okay, is there a second to that motion? Second, Commissioner Greer. Thank you, Commissioner Greer. It's been moved and seconded. Before we vote, I, I again want to thank uh, particularly uh, not only our commission staff, but the uh, staff of the uh, Maryland Historical Trust and the uh, Jefferson Patterson uh, Park Museum. Um, these MOUs, you know, they take a lot of time and a lot of effort, but uh, you know, they're a good thing for the state and uh, certainly a good thing for the Critical Area Commission. So I appreciate that. And with that, we'll take a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any abstentions? Any nay votes? Fantastic. That motion carried unanimously. We'll move. We're moving right along and uh, we'll go right into old business. Uh, Emily Venturi, you have a legal update for us. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Emily Vineri. Um, I have one legal update this afternoon involving the Rote case in Somerset County. And this is a case that you all received a notice about um, by email. And it's a new case for the Critical Area Commission. Um, Mr. Rote cleared nearly an acre of trees on his property in Mount Vernon, Maryland, and he was cited for a critical area violation by the county. Um, the Somerset County Board of Zoning Appeals affirmed that um, citation, that notice of violation, and then Mr. Rote filed a challenge to that decision to the Circuit Court of Somerset County. Um, so that's where we are right now in Circuit Court. The Commission um, is participating in the case along with the county, and so far um, the administrative record has been filed, and then the next step is for Mr. Rote to file his opening memorandum, and then at that point the county and the commission will respond to it. So I will keep you posted, but that is all I have for now. Thank you. Very good. Looking forward to the solution on that one, or the decision, I guess I should say. Um, Nick Kelly, did you have, well, have a MDOT MOU update? Yes, uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'll keep this brief, but um, Commission members, as you may recall, back at the April 7th meeting, the Commission voted to approve the MDOT Maryland Aviation Administration um, exhibit to the MDOT MOU. And with that approval was a condition requested by the project subcommittee um, to, for the Commission staff to work with MAA to, to deal with um, PFAS contamination. And if you, just as a quick refresher, um, those are chemicals that are very persistent in the environment, the human body, and they create a lot of adverse effects um, when there is exposure to them. And so the commission just sort of wanted to know, you know, if particularly where Martin State Airport is located, that if there are chemicals present, um, how would the commission be notified? Um, so commission staff met with Maryland Department of the Environment and the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, as well as MDOT Secretary's Office, um, and MAA back in May of 17th, uh, May 17th, 2021. 
Um, and in those conversations with MDE, we've learned a lot of information about their current efforts. Um, what we learned in general is that, that any project that requires a federal permit must have certification from the state that proposed discharge complies with state water quality standards. In addition, Maryland's water quality certifications, water quality standards do not allow the release of toxic substances in toxic amounts. And then finally, that any permit, whether general or specific to a project, has to adhere to these standards. So in a nutshell, any project in the critical area, if there's PFAS found on that site, would have to go through these permit procedures in order to be approved. So it's covered in that fashion. Um, as a result, we talked to the uh, project subcommittee this morning. Susan McClough did an excellent presentation, went a lot more detail. So if you want to learn more about PFAS, she's a great person to talk to. I mean, she can also get you into contact with people at MBE, such as Tammy Roberson, who had a lot of good information, our commissioner. Um, and as a result, we actually put together some draft language. The draft language is going to be added to the M.Y. wide MOU, not just the MAA exhibit, but to the entire M.Y. MOU to apply to any M.Y. facility. What it is going to do is that um, it ensures that any development activities in the critical area apply, have to apply and be to all federal, state, and local requirements. They have to meet those requirements, which include these for PFAS. Um, and if there is any development activity in the critical area on a land that has controlled hazardous substance or a chemical contamination, they will have to adhere to state water quality standards. So it just puts in a little bit of backup information. It's things that are already being done, but it just makes it more crystal clear in the MOU that these things are being completed. Um, the project subcommittee this morning discussed this. They were comfortable with the proposed amendments that we have. Um, they will be coming to you at a later date because that MOU will need to be updated. So those will be coming along with another amendment about electronic signatures, which is more of a legal thing, but you'll be seeing those hopefully the next commission meeting or two. Um, so that's the summary. Thank you very much, Nick. Anybody have any questions on Nick? Uh, yes, I do, uh, uh, Chairman Deegan. Uh, Nick, down in St. Mary's County, we have two Navy facilities. One's Patuxent Naval Air Station, and then there's an annex, which we call Webster Field. People who live in, they're both on the water in the critical area. Uh, people who live by the one in Webster Field uh, recently found some PFAS that had gotten into the water from a, a training exercise the Navy was doing and washed into the water. They've identified high levels of PFAS. Uh, PFAS in there. Are you familiar with this situation down here? That I am not aware of. I'm not. Okay. Well, uh, maybe it's something I bring to your attention because most recently the Navy has gone to a new type of foam. Uh, I'll use a new type of PFAS. I, I'm, I shouldn't call it that because I know PFAS is bad, but they recently had a 2,500 gallon spill and that went into our Marley Taylor wastewater treatment plant, which caused a big concern because the stuff foams up like crazy. And if you see it, you 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 probably think the worst. And uh, bottom line, though, is I was surprised that critical areas hadn't been involved in this. There's a man named Pat Elder that's been trying to get a lot of traction with this. He's a resident down there. Okay. I mean, I, w I do know that if it's a federal facility, they do have to be consistent with state laws and regulations, and they go through a federal consistency process. So uh, we see a lot of projects at Aberdeen Proving Grounds, for example, and they are required to be consistent with state environmental regulations. And there's other staff here in this office that might be able to better answer those questions. But I would think that anything's happening at Patuxent should be going through those same MDE processes that are happening at Martin State Airport. And if they're not, um, that might be something to discuss with Well, them. I may keep an eye on it and keep your yep. abreast. Yeah. Okay, thank know. you. Uh, Nick, if it's okay, I, I wouldn't mind just providing a little bit of background information. This is um, Commissioner Robertson. Um, I, MDE, um, the Land and Material Administration, LMA, they are very aware of both the Webster and Patuxent um, contamination at both of those facilities, and they are working very closely um, with um, with. MDE to actually identify the, the contamination. Um, so they've done some preliminary results and they know there's contamination and now they're um, moving forward with identifying the specific, um, I guess, level of contamination and identifying the actual perimeters of where that contamination is, um, has extended to. So, um, 
I think you'll see a lot more um, in the in the near future um, because I know I think it's this summer that they're going to be doing the additional um, testing to identify the the extent of that contamination. Um, and, and just so your awareness, you know, as MDE, as we have applications come in, you know, we just had um, a, an application come in for just some um, standard replacement of some mooring piles and, and installation. And we have required the uh, Pax River to take additional precautions um, to ensure that we don't have mobilization of PFAS um, for an area that we're not sure if is contaminated. Um, but we want to, but we're asking that additional um, measures be taken, such as um, double layers of turbidity curtains, and those turbidity curtains stay in place until the um, uh, the sediment has, um, you know, deposit has is no longer in the water column. So we are MDE is aware, and and there are. Um, cautionary measures that are being required at both of those facilities when earth disturbance is occurring. I'm sorry, Commissioner Hewitt again. I, I'm not sure who was speaking. If I could get your name and your in your position. Commissioner Robertson, I'm with MDE. Robinson, Tammy. Yes. I'm, sorry. I'm just checking. I just want to uh, follow back up and make sure our people are in touch with you. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Commissioner Hewitt. Appreciate that. Um, any other comments on that? If not, uh, Kate, did you have any uh, new business before I tell everybody we're probably not going to have a July meeting? And uh, but we will probably most likely have an August meeting. And do you want to talk about where that August meeting might be? No, it's going to be at the community place. <laughs> Yeah, I don't have any uh, new business. I was just going to share the same, Chairman Deegan, that um, we're trying to coordinate back with DGS on getting back into 100 Community Place. So we're just waiting for them to make the adjustments needed where um, we can all fit. So hopefully uh, news will bode well through the summer and they will let us back in, but we will keep you posted on that. The other thing is we're still we're still reaching out to MES and um, for a tour for Poplar Island and uh, Hart Miller maybe, um, and we might even pursue something back at the port since we have so many new commissioners. Uh, but we'll we'll try that through uh, June and July and August and see what happens there. It's you know with COVID, everybody uses COVID as an excuse for not doing something. So, um, but hopefully we'll get together in person. And if we fail on those big things, uh, I think Kate and I will start making a little round roundabout to state to meet some of the commissioners in person and uh, at least go to lunch. So with that, we'll adjourn the meeting and thank you all so much for your time today and look forward to seeing you soon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thanks, Charlie.